Russia has been hit by a massive wave of at least 25 drone and missile strikes as pro-Ukrainian partisans claim to have seized a border town and a Russian transport plane has gone down in flames. We're in Kharkiv again. My name is Jerome Starkey, I'm the defence editor of The Sun newspaper and this is Frontline, your latest weekly roundup of the most important news from the war in Ukraine. We're going to start today with the strikes on Russian soil because there have been a lot of them. Ukraine appears to have launched one of the largest drone and missile strikes against targets on Russian soil since the start of the war, with Russian officials saying that they have intercepted and shot down at least 25 drones. They've reported attacks in a range of regions from Moscow to Leningrad, Belgorod, Kursk, Tula and Oryol. At least two oil refineries appear to have been hit. At the same time, we've seen footage of an Aleutian 76 transport plane coming down in flames. Footage appeared to show that plane with a, with a flame, with a fire uh, coming from one of its in engines before it crashed at an airfield in Tula. Separately, but perhaps no coincidence, the Freedom of Russian Legion has claimed to have taken control of a border town of Tetkino, where they say uh, they've destroyed at least one Russian armoured personnel carrier and now, as of this moment, claim to have the town under their control. Now, this is a town in the Kursk Oblast, neighbouring the Ukrainian province of Sumy. It sits in a little uh, salient peninsula, if you like, of, of Russian territory, surrounded on three sides by Ukrainian territory. Now, this group uh, are we understand Russian nationals, but who are against Vladimir Putin's regime and who have been uh, living or taking uh, refuge on Ukrainian territory, but have launched attacks against Russian soil. All three things taken together, the drone and missile strikes, the incursion by these partisans and the loss of a transport plane makes today a bad day for Vladimir Putin and a bad day for his war effort. After months of attrition where we've seen momentum appeared to be with the Russians, with their grinding assaults, claiming Avdivka uh, most recently, this appears to at least be a break, uh, if not a full reversal, uh, a day where Ukraine has seized the initiative. The second thing I'd like to talk about today is the sacking of the commander of Russia's navy. Admiral Nikolai Yevmenev has been replaced by Alexander Moiseev, the commander of Russia's northern fleet based in the Arctic. Now, this change comes after Britain claimed Russia has lost almost a third of its Black Sea fleet. Defence Secretary Grant Shapps, who visited Kyiv last week, said that British missiles, drones and weapons had helped Ukraine to lay waste to those ships, to those submarines using, and he's promised at least 10,000 drones from the UK to Ukraine, including maritime drones. And it's those maritime drones most recently that have been having the most dramatic effect, particularly the Magura V5s. We've seen them striking vessels like the Sergei Kotov, most recently the Ivanovets before that. But we've also seen British Storm Shadow cruise missiles earlier in the war, which have been used to hit targets, including a Kilo class submarine when it was in dry dock and indeed the headquarters of the Black Sea Fleet in Sebastopol. Russia's Navy has taken a hammering over the last two years. It started perhaps most dramatically with the sinking of the Moskva and it has gone on and on and on. And that has been crucial because it has allowed Ukraine to keep its seaports open, to protect trade from ports like Odessa on the Black Sea and to allow it to get some of its grain out to global markets. So that has been an area where Ukraine has had a lot of success and we've seen a number of changes of personnel in the Russian administration the removal of the commander-in-chief of Russia's navy, perhaps the latest sign that the Kremlin, that Moscow, that Vladimir Putin is unhappy with the losses he's been suffering at sea. Finally, the third thing I'd like to talk about today is the calls from Pope Francis for Ukraine to surrender. Pope Francis gave an interview in which he claimed Ukraine needed to have the courage to show the white flag. Interpretation, it is one interpretation, it's true, but I think that the strongest one is the one who looks at the situation, thinks about the people, and has the courage of the white flag of negotiating. 
e negoziare. And today you can negotiate with the help of the international powers. There are some. Now this has caused predictable anger and outrage from inside Ukraine. It's a rare political intervention in the war from the Pope. At the beginning of the conflict two years ago, his his expressions, what his, his words appeared to express far more sympathy for the Ukrainians in the face of Russian aggression. And that was the time, of course, when we were seeing the siege of Mariupol and huge numbers of civilians being uh, harmed, killed and suffering as a result of the siege conditions, medieval siege conditions, not just in Mariupol, uh, but of course, uh, horrific conditions across the country as a result of that bombardment. Uh, most recently, the most recent reaction to that has come from the US State Department to the Pope's comments where they have reiterated their long-standing position that of course any peace negotiation uh, it's for Ukraine to decide on the time and the conditions that it is willing to negotiate. Ukraine has said it's not willing to negotiate as of now and indeed actually so has Russia. Both sides have rejected uh, the Pope's calls for negotiations. That has not gone down particularly well but of course perhaps it is the place of a spiritual leader like the Pope uh, to make those uncomfortable suggestions that neither side wants to hear. There's no doubt that this conflict is causing a huge amount of human suffering and that appears to have been the focus of his message, trying to end that suffering. As ever, if you do have any questions and you're watching on YouTube, please don't forget, write your questions in the comments below and we'll endeavour to do our best to answer them uh, next week. First question today from a regular viewer, Jay O'Carlo, asking how bad is the situation on the front? Uh, is the shortage of artillery shells really starting to bite? And the answer to the shortage of shells is yes, it is starting to bite. How bad is the situation on the front? It's pretty bleak. I'm just back from two and a half weeks in Ukraine. And I can tell you that you know, soldiers there were telling me that they are rationing ammunition much more severely than they would like. I spoke to soldiers who were involved in the bloody and difficult retreat from Avdivka, and they said that one of the reasons they were unable to hold that position, which had been the scene of so much bloodshed, was because they didn't have enough artillery shells. And I went further north to the Kupiansk front, northeastern front, east of Kharkiv, and there the soldiers were saying that the shortage of artillery shells is leading them to a reliance on their vampire drones. So they were using these drones, the ones that carry bombs, uh, to hit Russian targets behind the front lines at the sort of range you might expect a howitzer to hit targets. But because they didn't have enough of those large uh, 152 millimeter shells. Instead, they were using relatively small but anti-tank grenades, high explosive grenades dropped off the bottom of these drones. Now, in one sense, it's extraordinary. These are relatively inexpensive drones dropping very crude munitions, munitions that haven't changed an awful lot for a hundred years. But the way they were doing that of course, was with satellite technology controlling these devices via satellite internet terminals. So Ukraine, as ever in this conflict, finding ways to innovate, to get round the shortages that it faces, and indeed all armies face shortages in conflict. But nonetheless, Kiev understandably is making the case to its allies that if it is to stay in this fight, is if it is to defeat Russia and roll back uh, Vladimir Putin's invaders, then it needs continuing support from its allies in the West, most notably from America. And the US package of military aid worth about $60 billion to Ukraine continues to be held up in Congress by domestic political wrangling in America. And we've seen a number of messages uh, from a number of allies, but including uh, Defence Secretary Grant Shapps on his recent visit to Kyiv, where he issued what he called an alarm call to Ukraine's other allies to try and follow Britain's example of sending significant amounts of aid. And as he said that, he pledged 10,000 drones, another 125 uh, million pounds towards uh, the Ukraine drone fund that Britain has uh, provided. And he said a lot of those drones, as I mentioned before, would include the maritime uh, variety, which have been used, uh, well, drones of the maritime variety have been used to huge effect against Russia's navy. 
second and final question today is uh, the verdict on the tanks. Um, how is the Challenger 2, the British Challenger 2, performing in Ukraine? And this is on the strength, obviously, that uh, one of the things we managed to do on our recent visit was to meet the Challenger squadron, meet Ukraine's Challenger squadron. And that's been amazing because for the last year since those British tanks arrived in Ukraine, it's been almost impossible for anyone to meet and speak to the soldiers who have been using them. These tanks were involved in Ukraine's summer counteroffensive last summer and autumn, where Ukraine tried but ultimately was unable to break through the Russian defensive lines in south central Zaporizhia. We spent a day with the tank crews and they had a couple of really interesting messages. They were really impressed with the Challenger 2's accuracy. That was by far and away the most important quality that that tank has given them on the battlefield. And we watched them firing with almost pinpoint accuracy, hitting targets about the size of a dinner plate from more than a mile away. And that was when the tank was firing on the move. They said that most of the targets they've been hitting have been at about four and a half kilometers. Now that is close to the record range for a tank kill, one tank killing another tank in history. That was a record set by a Challenger 1, the Challenger 2's predecessor in Iraq. But they said two things. One, the tank has not been used in a traditional tank-on-tank -tank battle. The Challenger has not been used to shoot against Russian tanks, and that's because of the nature of the terrain, the nature of the targets that they are able to access uh, where they are fighting. Instead, they said they've been hitting uh, other Russian vehicles and hardened Russian positions, bunkers uh, in uh, along the front line. Now, the ammunition that the Challenger has uh, is very effective against bunkers, but it's not very effective against infantry in the open. And they did mention that actually NATO tanks are designed for a slightly different purpose to Soviet-era tanks, including uh, the T-72, the T-80, the T-90, which are sort of more all-purpose uh, machines and there is a learning curve they believe that their own commanders have to go through in terms of how to use NATO tanks best on the battlefield. The other issue they raised which was of great concern was the Challenger 2's mobility and they said that because it's so large it's so heavy and that's partly to do with its size and the hydraulics which make the gun so effective but that weight has been a problem for them because this tank which weighs around 62 64 tons uh, in the way it's been delivered to ukraine is sinking into the mud they're finding it hard to get around the battlefield that was possibly what may have contributed to uh, losing one of the challenger tanks we we know that it was uh, it blew a track some suggestions that the one challenger tank that has been destroyed hit a tank mine it was stranded on the battlefield and the following day it was destroyed by a russian lancet mine when we were with them, uh, the tank we were on got stuck in the mud and we witnessed them calling up a second tank to pull it out. So uh, the verdict on the Challengers, and this is from people who have commanded Russian T-80s and Challenger 2s in battle. There are very few of those people who've experienced both uh, of those commands uh, with a mixed report on the Challenger. Very accurate, but problems with mobility. That's all for this week. As ever, if you do have comments or questions and you're watching on YouTube, please don't forget to ask them in the comments below and we'll endeavour uh, to answer them next time. Please subscribe and like, to the, like the sun so you don't miss out on any of these videos. And if you're listening to this as a podcast, then please don't forget to subscribe wherever you get your podcasts and we'll join you again next week.